only two more chapters. There's not even a whole lot from each one of those chapters I really need you to know. So let's switch the camera and see what we can do. Anything you do in a business or even in life, if you're a treasurer of your sorority or fraternity, or once you get older, any club that you belong to, if you tell them you're a business person, you'll end up being the treasurer. You often deal with cash. And a real key thing you have to think about are internal controls. And internal controls are the rules the company has to prevent theft, fraud, and errors. So no matter what organization you're in, you really want to make sure that there's not some major problem while you are in charge. Because even though it might not be you doing it, if you don't set up the internal controls, you get the blame. There's things that the internal controls are meant to do. I remember safe. The first one actually is safe. To safeguard assets and make sure people aren't walking off with your inventory or all your office supplies or even worse, your computers. We want to assure accuracy. Double entry bookkeeping, for example, part of that is to make sure that our records are accurate. If our debits don't equal our credits, we know we've made a mistake. Force compliance with company policies. that You don't normally think of that. A lot of companies will have a policy, say, for example, if you go on a trip, they'll have a limit to the amount you can spend per day. And you have to have receipts to make sure that you really went on the trip. A company, they gave people company cars and they were only supposed to use those company cars for business. And they gave them a gas card for those cars. And when the auditors looked, they found those cars were only getting like two miles to the gallon based on the mileage of the cars and the bills. Were they just really in need of a tune-up? And the answer is no. People were filling up their spouse's cars and their personal cars and using the company credit card. So we need to have some controls to make sure if we have those kind of policies, the employees are complying with those. The last one is to ensure efficiency. So we do want to make sure that uh, our internal controls make us run a little bit more efficiently than we might otherwise. One thing that happens is this one is sometimes in conflict with these because one of the things we find is if you do something two or three times, you'll catch all your errors. You might have a whole lot of paperwork to make sure your, asset, your assets are good, but ensure efficiency is another component. So you don't want to set up so many controls that you're not efficient anymore. There was a point when the budget was tight and in order to buy a stapler, it had to be approved from your department chair to the dean to the provost to the president of the university. I guess it did cause people not to buy anything. You bought it yourself because it was such a pain, but it made the thing so inefficient that nothing got done. So you want to make sure that you think about all four of those and not just one or two. A thing that you just need to know as, again, a business person is there's an act that was passed in 2002 called the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And they were just some congressmen, one was Sarbanes and one's Oxley. It was when we had a lot of frauds. We had the Enrons and the WorldComs. They created the Sarbanes-Oxley. That's the federal rules that state companies must disclose some of their internal controls in the annual report. So you not only do your financial statements, you do this other disclosure. It's called the 404 report because it was section 404 of that act. The main rules are to make sure you safeguard your assets, ensure accuracy, force compliance, and ensure accuracy is separation of duties. And that just means more than one person involved in every transaction. You don't need to have 100 people, but you need to have more than one. The things we need to separate 
custody of the asset. We need authorization for the transaction. And you need another person to record the transaction. If you have any two of them combined, bad things can happen to you. Let me just give you some examples. If you put custody and authorization together, then if I want a computer for my kids because they have to learn from home now, and I can authorize the purchase of a computer, and I'm the one who has custody of the computer, I authorize it, tell the business, buy a computer, comes to me, I tuck it home, nobody's the wiser. You need one person to authorize and somebody else to check it. You know, at the university, sometimes the fixed asset people come around and check to make sure those computers are actually sitting on people's desks. Authorization and recording. For authorization and recording the transaction, that's when you can create a fraud or embezzlement where you can just make up sales, for example. If I'm a salesperson and I want my sales to go up, so I get a bigger commission. If I'm the one who's actually doing the accounting and I authorize it, I can say there's a sale and record that transaction. That's an issue there. Going these two, if I have custody of the asset, especially if it's something of value, and I record the transaction, that's when I can embezzle. The most common embezzlement scheme is called lapping. I'm just going to give you a little example. Let's say I'm customer A, and we'll say we're the utility company where people come in and give us cash. This works with checks, but it's easier to see with cash. They come in and pay their bill, and it's $100. What I do is I don't record it. I just pocket that cash. Nobody's the wiser. But now, customer A is going to scream if they get the next bill and say, well, I paid it. So when customer B comes in, and we'll say everybody has the same amount, when they pay their $100, A is going to scream because I just stole their money. So what I do is I record this as if it's from A. So then customer C comes in, gives us their $100, and I record it from B. Let's say the statements come out and customer C says, well, I paid my $100 and it doesn't show that I paid it. They don't even have to call the same person who stole the money. If they call somebody in India, it, they'll say, oh, well, yeah, it's fine because it just got recorded on the next day when customer D came in. You're always just a person lately and that $100 is missing and nobody's the wiser. I have the custody of the cash and I'm the one recording it and nobody else knows how many customers really came in and paid their bill. And while that seems maybe convoluted, that's the most common one. Long, long time ago, before you were born, we had that problem at the bursar's office where people are coming in and paying their tuition. Somebody was just taking the cash and they also did the bank rec because they were recording it and they were even doing the bank rec at the end when somebody else came and did the bank reconciliation, they found they were way short. I'm going to skip ahead for this lapping. What you need to do is you need to have somebody check what comes in first. And that's why all those things give you that little stub to send in separate from your check. So these are, you have one person get this pre-list. And normally we have, we say the mailroom clerk opens it, but it's not really always the mailroom clerk. But one person keeps a list of what you received. And then another one does the deposit. Often these people will go ahead and make the journal entries and these people make the deposit. So that way the deposit and what came in have to be the same. If I trade to take that hundred, the pre-list would say $300 came in that day and only 200 got deposited. Where's the extra hundred? Balancing the cash register. Any of you who work in retail, restaurants, whatever, at the end of the day, the cash has to equal the cash on the receipts. And that works anytime 
people require a receipt. What this won't catch is if the cashier doesn't ring it up at all. So if a friend goes through and uh, you just don't ring it up, you're not gonna see it. If you don't ring it up and then void it afterwards, that's the way you take the cash. So you have to have controls over returns and voids. That's why when there's a void, you have to sit there and wait until the manager comes over. And it's annoying, but as a business person, you know that that's the way you steal the money. I'm gonna put one more in here. Coupons, you know, that 50 cent coupon probably is not worth it, but if people are giving uh, $25 coupons and $100 gift cards, those sorts of things are a nice easy way to say, well, they had a coupon. So you have to account for those coupons. One other thing you can do is a lockbox for mailed cash receipts. What a lockbox is, is it's the way to do this remittance pre list. Instead, your customers send the amount directly to the bank. The lockbox isn't a lockbox like you have in your house. It's a service offered by banks. So you send the amount straight to the bank. The bank then makes the deposit and just sends the list to the company. So the question is, why can't the bank steal the money then since they're the ones who got the cash to start with? And the reason is, the customer will scream because they don't have any way to make the customer's account right because that's what's done by the company. So they have the custody of the asset and the company does the recording. The last thing that most companies have is a little, little petty cash fund. This is cash on hand. Normally there's some cash sitting in somebody's drawer somewhere so they can buy stamps and little things. The trick there is you set a balance for that. So whatever seems reasonable, you know, you might have like $100 in there. Then you keep all your receipts. Then your receipts plus the cash has to equal $100 all the time. If you spend $5, you should have $95 left in there. Then you just replenish based on those receipts. That's really all I need you to know about cash other than the bank reconciliation. 